Hey, this is Artie Cabral. This is Sarah Nofke. This is Stefan Boltz. This is S. Elliot Brandis, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woohoo! Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Our guest today is author Philip Harris. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good, Preston. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for joining us. Um, we started something new with the podcast we've done over the past several episodes. I've started out with a segment called Two Truths and a Lie, where you're going to tell us two truths about you and a lie, and I have to figure out which one's the lie. Um, not doing too good up to this point at winning, but um, <laughs> if you would, do you have two truths and a lie for us? I do indeed. So, um First off, um, I used to sing in uh, a couple of gothic rock bands with some friends of mine. Um, nothing major, but just kind of around the local local clubs and things like that. Recorded a CD, but uh, we didn't we didn't make it big. Um, so that's the first one. Um, second one. Uh, this year, I ran the Boston Marathon. Um, I run marathons. My best time is um, about three hours three minutes. Um, I didn't do that in, in Boston. It was more like 315, but um, that's that's number two. Uh, and then number three is when I was a kid, I was in a play. Um, I actually played Santa and got to hit some of the other actors um, with a balloon stuck to a stick. <laughs> and that, that is the third one. All right. Well, I know uh, from following you that I'm like 99% sure that number one is true. Um, so it comes down to number two and number three. Dang. I was I'm trying to remember if I saw any post about you running a marathon. I know, I think you've posted about marathons. Is it you that post about running near your house? Dang. Um, I'm going to say that number two is the lie because number three is just so funny that I hope it is true. <laughs> so I'm going to say number two is the lie. So number two, and you're, you're sure about that. You don't want to want to change your mind? You, know, you want to definitely want to go with number two. I'm not sure, but I'm hoping number three is true because there's got to be a great story behind it. it is. <laughs> So, well, yeah. I can t- I can tell you that number three is true. Awesome, <laughs> and number two is the lie. So you got it right. Awesome. I I do run marathons, um, but uh, it's actually a friend of mine that runs that quick. I I run quite a lot slower than that. My best time is um, four hours fifteen. Um, okay. My wife my wife has run Boston. Um, and, and a friend of mine, but, uh, I'm too slow. Um, but yes, I was in a goth rock band, um, many years ago, actually a couple, um, with some, some friends of mine and played some little gigs and, and that kind of thing. We're not very good. So, um, we, uh, at least I'm not a very good singer. They, they play very well, but, uh, I'm a terrible <laughs> singer. So, um, we, we didn't get very far. Um, and the play was a real play. Um, uh, I, I guess I must have been about nine or ten, maybe a little bit younger. And we, we did a play called The Tinderbox, which is actually a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale that's really quite dark um, about a, a soldier who gets a tinderbox that lets him summon these three giant dogs. And um, he uses them to kidnap a princess um, and uh, uh, gets caught. And uh, sentenced to death, and then just before he's executed, he uses the tinderbox to to summon the dogs again, and the dogs kill the king and queen, and and he marries the princess, obviously, um, and then they all have a big party, and the dogs go to the party and eat the food, which is all very strange. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure the play that we did when I was eight didn't have people killing the king and queen and, and things like that. And um, for some reason, I think it, it's like a, an Elizabethan tradition or something. Um, I was I was the fool dressed up as Santa and I had a stick with a balloon on. Um, and a couple of times I ran onto the stage and I hit people with a balloon. Um, <laughs> so I've no, I really don't know why, but um, <laughs> I, I think it was just the teacher having fun and just making us look stupid. But um, but that one was true. So you got it right. You're... you're uh, well done. <laughs> that, that is a funny story. <laughs> um, so for those that might not know 
uh, kind of who you are or what you do. Uh, why don't you kind of introduce people and tell them who you are and what you do? Sure. So um, I was originally born in the UK um, about almost 12 years ago now. Um, I moved to Canada. Um, I work in the video game industry, which is why I moved here. Um, I work at a, vid, a big video game company um, on the West Coast of Canada. But pretty much in my, most of my spare time is devoted to writing. Um, I've been writing for a long, long time. Um, most well known, I guess, for my uh, Leah King books, which is a trilogy of dystopian science fiction. The first one's a novella and the, the next two are novels um, that are all set in Michael Bunker's Pennsylvania world. Um, and I've also got a sort of a pulp action adventure science fiction story called Glitch Mitchell and the Unseen Planet um, and some short stories and, and that kind of thing. And I've been published in anthologies and, and magazines and that kind of stuff as well. But that's that's pretty much the the, the core of it. So what do you do for the video game company that you work for? Um, so I'm actually um, a software engineer. Um, so I've uh, at the moment, I'm a kind of hands-on programmer. Um, I've also been kind of managing one team and I've managed multiple teams and things like that. Um, but at the moment, um, I kind of wanted to get back to hands-on. Um, I tend to get involved with the kind of story side of things, um, which is really why what, what attracts me to the video game industry is, is the creative element. Um, you know, which, which obviously ties into the writing as well. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I think, I think if I worked in a bank, I might get paid more but um it would probably it would probably kill me um uh you know, i've worked i've worked on games for a long time now it's i think it's 25 years or so um of various various game projects um and and it's a very creative environment it's quite different to writing because it's a a team you know we have even a small team here is is 30 or 40 people um the team i'm on now is is about 90 at the moment but we'll we'll probably get up to about 200 by the time we we get into the into production the main development of the game so it's it's a very collaborative effort and you ha you own your little slice but you work with a lot of different people so it, it's very different to writing where you're just kind of sitting in a room making stuff up and nobody else you know nobody has nobody else has to say what you're doing you just just make it up but uh but yeah it's it's a good good creative industry can you tell us any of the games that you have worked on um i've i've worked on a lot of different things um uh, there's a lot that people will not have heard of. Um, one one of the one of the first big games I've worked on was a game called uh, Dogs of War, which I think sold maybe three copies in America, um, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, the head of the company that published it got fired shortly after that, and we're pretty sure it was our fault. Um, but I've worked on bigger games as well. Um, I've worked on uh, quite a few sports games. I've done the NHL hockey game. Um, I've worked on the UFC game. Um, I worked on the SSX snowboarding reboot that came out a few years ago. Um, quite a quite a um, kind of uh, technical director role on that. So I was quite quite involved in that. It's quite a long project. Um, some some smaller games, and then a whole bunch of games. Um, that were just never released. That one of the one of the uh, fun things about uh, working in the games industry is you quite often work on a game for for maybe even a couple of years, and then um, for whatever reason it ends up not getting released. Um, so I've worked on a, a massively multiplayer online role playing game um, for a while that then got cancelled, and then I worked on a football game, soccer game for you guys um, for a little while, and then that got cancelled and. Um, that kind of thing. Um, I'm currently working on um, a pretty big game. It's set um, set in a universe that you guys might have heard heard of, um, Star Wars. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so uh, we're working on a Star Wars game, but that that's literally everything I can tell you about that game. Oh, wow. um, and we actually we got special permission this morning to tell people that we're working on Star Wars um, because we're it, everything's so secretive. So I I can't tell you anything about it. But uh, other than that, it will be really really good. Oh, but, awesome. Um, <laughs> other than that, but uh, but yeah, lot, lots and lots of games. I've lost count. Uh, it's probably over thirty games. Wow, that's awesome. We, we we've had one other author on here. Um, 
well, he used to work for video games. Uh, Justin Sloan. Yes. Yep. To- he, uh, yeah. He worked for Telltale. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I've, I've, I've never met him, never spoken to him or anything, but, uh, I've kind of been, been following his stuff and I, I like his stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've listened to that one. Did you get your love for video games first or your love for, uh, reading and writing stories first? Um, definitely stories first. Okay. Um, I mean, I've, I've been making up stories since I was a little kid. Um, I used to, that was how I got to sleep. You know, when I was kind of six, seven, eight, um, I would lie in bed and I would just make up adventure stories. Um, and there would be, you know, an episode every night. And basically it was just me being a hero, rescuing someone from the bad guys, um, set in the forest or the wood behind our house or whatever. Um, but we used to live opposite a library. So, um, I, I could go over there and, you know, just grab lots and lots of books to read. And, and our family used to, um, you know, my mom and dad were really into books and would read a lot. And so books were always quite a, quite a big thing. Um, but you know, as, obviously as everybody knows, <laughs> writing is not a, not a great career. And particularly back then, this was a long, long time ago, well before indie publishing, um, started to become, become viable for writers to, to make enough money to earn a living. Um, you had to do something, you know, had to have a real job. Um, so, uh, I discovered way back, I think I was about 13 and I, uh, my dad brought home a, a home computer, a ZX81 home computer, um, which is a, um, very, very basic, very, very basic um, home computer. It had, uh, one kilobyte of memory. So a thousand, <laughs> a thousand characters of memory. So, you know, what, eight, eight tweets worth of memory. Um, um, and, and you could write little games and, and basically the first, the first evening he brought it home, I was typing in a game from a magazine, um, and it didn't work, which, um, and then I, I basically spent that whole evening trying to work out why this thing I typed in didn't work. Um, and we, we got no way to save it. So I basically, we had to turn it off. I never got it to work. Um, so my first experience was, was trying to get something to work on a computer, um, which is pretty much what I do for a living now. Um, type, type things in and then they don't work and I have to work out why. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of got, got drawn into it. Um, and you know, programming became, you know, it, it, it's something that I'm, I'm reasonably good at. And it was an obvious thing to move in from a, from a career perspective, but the writing and story has always been there in the background. Um, sometimes I, I combined the two for a while. I had a, a monthly column in an Amiga computing magazine, um, uh, talking about at, at the time we called it communications, um, which now would be online. Um, but this was before the internet. Um, and it was all about how you could dial into a bulletin board using a modem and, you know, uh, what, what speed modem you could get. You know, you'd have a 300 board modem or if you were really rich, you could have a 9600 board modem. Um, which I dread to think. I, I don't even know what that speed is now. It's uh, 30 characters a second or something. So, um, so the writing was, was always there in the background. Um, and I kept doing it on and off and, and, uh, Sort of, but, but had to have a real career that was going to earn me some money. Right. Um, and as you said, you, uh, one of the things you're known for is the, uh, Leia King books that are set in Michael Bunker's, uh, world of Pennsylvania. What was it about the world of Pennsylvania that made you want to write in that world? Um, it, it was really, I mean, I, I like the books. I, I like the idea of Amish science fiction. I, I read, I read them in the block. I waited until he'd released all the, I think it's five parts and he, he'd released them all. Um, so I read the whole thing as a, as a single book, um, because I prefer to do that. Um, and there was, you know, I, I, I liked it and enjoyed it and I didn't really plan to write anything in it, but, um, without going into spoilers, there's a big event in Pennsylvania, um, and, uh, involving the city, which is, is the city in the book. Um, and it kind of, kind of stuck with me and th- this idea of, you know, there's other people that would be affected by this event. Um, and I had this kind of idea for a character, this, this young girl, Leah, who lives in the city. And, and, um, for those who don't know Pennsylvania, uh, there's kind of a government 
organization, I guess, called Transport, which is rules rules quite a in a uh, with an iron fist, if you like, is is the kind of dystopian government, and then Trace, which is the terrorist organization, if you like. Um, and I I just had this idea of this this girl living in the city up to that big event um, that that happens in Pennsylvania, and and it kind of developed from there. And it I again I hadn't really planned to to write it, but it just kind of stuck with me. And and there was a few people writing in the Pennsylvania universe, and I I thought oh, you know let let's just play with this. And I thought I'd just write a short story, um, but it kind of grew and and expanded until it became you know. Uh, novella length. I, I emailed um, Michael and asked him if it was okay if I wrote the story, and he was very encouraging and said, "Yes, you should, and you should release it." Um, and up until that point, I, I'd released some short stories just as an experiment to do the, um, uh, you know, just to just to try self-publishing. Um, but you know, then I'd got this uh, this story, um, and. You know, I, I got it development edit. I sent to an editor, and and he really liked it, and. It was very gave me some good feedback, but also it got some some very positive things to say about it from a story structure point of view. So, um, so I decided that you know it was worth a try. I put it out there, and um, people seemed to like it. So I I ended up again. It, it, you know, it was a it was a standalone story, and and I think for for most part, people see it as a standalone story, although it's you know it, there's there's things beyond the end of the story, um, but they. People were keen for me to write another one, um, and and Chris Porto actually emailed me and said, "Hey, um, we're building a list of of Pennsylvania stories. Are you doing any more after the Girl in the City?" And I I just said, "Yeah, sure. Um, I'm doing one called the Girl in the Wilderness and one called the Girl in the Machine, and that's all I knew about them um, because I just made up these two titles that I liked, um, and I said, you know, I might not actually write them, but." You know, if I was to write them, that's what they'd be called. Um, and then in the end, I, uh, you know, people people seem to enjoy it. Um, it's getting good reviews. Um, so I decided that I would I would expand it. Would write those two two remaining books. Um, uh, and the girl in the wilderness is the is the second one, which came out at the beginning of October, and that that follows on directly. Uh, well, it's about a month after the end of um, The Girl in the City. Um, and it, it too is a self-contained story, but it, it opens a few threads that will then get tied up in the third book, which which comes out in January. Oh, wow. So will there only be three books in that series, or do you think it might possibly go longer? Um, I think it will be three. I, I've put a lot of effort into the ending and making the ending um, satisfying for people. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer for, for any kind of book, any kind of short story that they're, they're a slice of time. They're not, you know, the world doesn't end at the end of a story or a book. Um, and I, 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 I quite enjoy stories that end either ambiguously or, you know, there, there's, there's some indication that life goes on beyond, beyond the end of the book. But, um, I also wanted to be very, I'm, I'm very aware that not everybody likes that. And, you know, they like things to be a clear ending. Um, so I put a lot of effort into making sure that that ending ties up all the loose ends. It, it has a, a satisfying conclusion. Um, and it feels like the end of the story. Um, I think it could definitely write, write more and there's it's a it's a very rich world um you know i've uh i i did i think i probably took some liberties with the the pennsylvania universe um but it it it's uh it's it's a very interesting kind of transport and trace and the relationship between the two and and kind of how it relates to kind of the the evolution of of our world and that kind of thing is is very interesting so you could do more but um I, I've made. I'm hoping that people will be satisfied with this with this trilogy, and it'll be, it's a good length book. I'll do a, an omnibus edition as well. But um, but yeah, I, I don't think I'll be doing more. I've got I've got a, a zombie series that I've got a couple of books written, and then I've got another kind of um, I guess it's kind of horror series that uh, I've written the first book of, and I'll be moving on to those next year. So I'm going to be too busy to do more. <laughs> right. Um. And you uh, write in several different genres. You do kind of horror to science fiction to fantasy. Um, why such a wide variety? Um, 
I've spent a lot of time writing short stories. And like I said, you know, I, I grew up reading a, a lot of different books. Um, I've definitely gravitated towards science fiction and horror late, you know, later on in, in life from my teens. Um, but because you're writing short stories, you can pretty much write anything as a short story author. Um, you know, you, you're basically just, you write something and you, you send it off to a magazine in the hope that they'll publish it. Um, and I've had a lot of different stories published. And, and so I didn't really kind of box myself into that corner. Um, whereas nowadays for indie authors, you really want to pick a, a genre and, and focus on that and just write a series in that. Um, and I've kind of, from a business point of view and a, a smart author point of view, I've got done exactly the wrong thing in that we've got glitch, which is, is very much short pulp action adventure. Um, and then you've got, you know, I've, my zombie novel is, is definitely horror. And then you've got dystopian science fiction. And then you've got, I've also got another book, which um, I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do, but it, I'm not even sure what you would call it. It's kind of science fiction. It's kind of fancy. There's, there might be some steampunk in it, depending on how I edit it. Um, so it's, it's kind of weird. And I, that's why I haven't done anything with it, because I don't think, I don't think I know how to market it. So, um, but it, that said, I think there's there's definitely some similarity in themes around the stories. There's a lot of um, I realized this week that that memory has come up a lot in uh, a lot of my fiction. Um, I'm working on a, a science fiction story at the moment that has kind of memories. A guy's memories of his past is is key to it, and um, I have a short story coming out. Um, probably next year. I think it'll be early next year now um, in an anthology called Uncommon Minds, which is all about memory. Um, and I've got various other short stories that are about memories. So um, I think even though I write in different genres, the tone is very definitely the same. Um, I tend to tend to edge edge towards darker themes, um, and the writing I think is is pretty similar. Um, I rarely do comedy and if i do it tends to be dark comedy um but uh but yeah so i i i'm trying to rein myself in and not distract get distracted by shiny things um <laughs> but it, but it's tough so i think next year will be a bit more be a bit a bit more on the darker kind of more horror side of things okay when did you first learn about indie publishing and what inspired you to go out and publish uh, your books indie um well there was really some this this guy that probably nobody's really heard of hugh howie um <laughs> he uh he you know he's such a, a champion of of indie publishing that it's hard to ignore him um but I discovered him through the wall short story. Um, and that, that's actually a perfect example of what I was talking about, about people wanting an ending. Um, and for me, th that short story was perfect. You know, I love the ending of that. Um, uh, because it, it, it doesn't answer you know, all the questions at all, but it gives you this fantastic twist. Um, and for me, it, it's, that's the perfect sort of short story. Um, and I, you know, I know from from seeing interviews with him that you know it was people's desire to learn more about that 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 led him to write Wall and the, and the rest of it. You know, and that, I don't know how many hundred thousand words there are from that single short story. Um, but you know, so so having read Wall, I kind of got interested in him, and and I like reading blogs, and I like reading about authors, um, and I I don't think I'd really, I certainly hadn't taken indie publishing seriously up until that point. Um, and even then, it took me quite a long time to to kind of get comfortable with the idea because I'd, I'd grown up in the traditional publishing kind of world where you needed someone else to, to look at your story and say, ah, yes, this is good. I will publish this, um, you know, and, and to basically stamp it and say, yes, this is good enough um, for me to, to give it to other people. Now, even though really that's a very personal decision and, you know, if the, if the editor's having a bad day, they can, you know, they're going to turn down your story. Um, and there's, you know, there's very famous examples of people who've taken stories that were published in a magazine and then resubmitted them to the same magazine and had them rejected. So there's no, you know, it's, it's complete luck really. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and I I toyed around with ideas for novels, and I'd started novels. I, I've I've got sixty five thousand words of a novel um, that I wrote that is is really really terrible. Um, basically, the character it's sixty five thousand words, and she goes from her home in the suburbs of London to the middle of London, and that's it. That's all she does in sixty five thousand words. All sorts of wacky stuff happens along the way, but it's basically the first chapter of the novel. Um, spread out to 65,000 words. Wow. So I, I, I will not be continuing that. I might take the idea, but, um, but yeah, it was just me making stuff up as I went along. Um, so, I, but the idea of doing a, a novel, it just seemed such a, a long shot that the chances of being published were tiny. The chances of making any money from that were tiny. Um, but I, ha- I have this writing itch that, um, I, I, I always wanted to write and I kept getting pulled back to it. I would, I would quit writing and say, no, it's a waste of time. Um, and then, you know, a year later I'd be back and I'd be writing again. So from that kind of being immersed in, in Hugh Howe's world and I started looking at other authors and started looking at indie publishing and, and started thinking, well, you know, I, by that point I'd got sort of 19, 20 short stories written, um, published, I mean, um, and it felt like, you know, actually maybe I could just try it and see what people, people think of it. Um, and, and I ended up going, you know, trying it with some short stories and then I did the girl in the city and then I did glitch. Um, and it, it's very nerve wracking because I still have, that still part of me want, it feels like I'm inflicting myself on someone else. You know, being a, being a writer, I think is, you have to have a certain amount of arrogance because you're basically saying to people, okay, firstly, you should give me some money. Um, and then when you've given me some money, you should spend three, four, five, six, ten hours reading what I have to say. Um, because my, my story is that good that I'm going to take up that much of your time. Um, and I think that, that there's a certain amount of arrogance there. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it it makes me slightly uncomfortable, but obviously not uncomfortable enough not to, you know, to stop me doing it. So, um, you know, it, it took me a while to pluck up the courage and, and, and try it. Um, now I don't really have a problem with it. I just put a lot of effort into trying to make it as good a story as I can. Um, and then, you know, people seem to like it, which helps, um, you know, when you get emails telling, telling you how much they enjoyed this, the, the short story or the novel or whatever, then that's, um, that, that's, that's the encouragement you need. <laughs> Imagine being a, a epic fantasy writer. I want you to invest twenty four hours in my story. I, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah, it's it. You know, I yeah, I. <laughs> I mean, it's it's bad enough for you know a, a traditionally published Brandon Sanderson or something like that. You know, his uh, his epic tomes, but to to self publish something like that, and you know, a lot of the time it's the first in a trilogy. So you know, you're not. It's not just one book. I'm gonna gonna get you hooked on three books because my writing's that good. So, um, yeah, it's 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 pretty strange. <laughs> and of course, as you said, one of one of the other stories that you're kind of known for is Glitch Mitchell and the Unseen Planet. Um, for those that might not know about that story, can you kind of give them the book blurb on what Glitch Mitchell is about? Yeah, sure. It's um, it's a, a pulp science fiction. It's about um. Glitch Mitchell, um, who is uh, kind of this nerdy, nerdy teenager, I guess, and he wins a competition to go and visit NASA, and they've they've discovered a gateway, and they basically have a, a competition to to go and see it. And when he goes to see it, there's a a guy there who is basically um, blows up the the gateway and glitch. And um, Scarlett Anderson, the captain, is uh, pulled through to this gateway onto another planet. Um, and it's basically um, about about those two and um, uh, a doctor as well, who's who basically John Smith, who's the bad guy, takes her through him with him and kidnaps her. Um, and it's it's inspired by the old Flash Gordon serials. So every single chapter has a cliffhanger ending. Um, uh, so I think it's about 25, 26 chapters, um, and there are a couple of thousand words, and they end with a cliffhanger, and then there's a you know a resolution, and then straight back into more peril, um, and it basically just gets bigger and and more dangerous throughout the whole book. Um, and it, I when I was a kid, um, 
they used to put Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and things, the old cinema black and white uh, serials on television every summer and every Christmas. And it was it was a standard thing at the mor- in the morning at 10 o'clock. You would get two or three of these these cliffhanger serials and you would get one episode every day. And that was how I started my my day when I was a kid. Um, so really, um, I, I wanted to write that type of book. And again, it was something else that from a business point of view, it's really dumb because it's not really a genre that I write a lot of. Um, but it started out as I was just going to post it on my website. Um, and then I, I found, thanks to Hugh Howie, I found a cover artist and, and he wrote me a really nice cover or drew me a really nice cover custom cover. And once I had that cover, then really I had to publish it. So um, I spent quite a lot of time trying to trying to make the book live up to the cover um, and ended up publishing it. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's done reasonably well. It's not a particularly commercial product and there's only one of it. Um, you know, indie publishing is, is very much about having a series. So um, I, I uh, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good story and I, I like it. Um, and it, I do, funnily enough, again, talking about you know, being dumb and, and doing lots of different genres, I have a, a, another Glitch Michel short story coming out in um, Sam Peralta's um, Jurassic Chronicles. Awesome. Um, so I, uh, because it was just too perfect, it, it, you know, it's like, okay, can you write a story about dinosaurs and, you know, a pulp story about, you know, dinosaurs and glitch mitchell and and some of the other characters from that first book it was too good to resist um even <laughs> even though again it's not probably not really a good business decision but it was it's a fun 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 story to write so it's a fun story to read i haven't finished it yet um i forget, where, yeah, I, I forget where i am in the book but the writing is fun and as you said the cover is just absolutely phenomenal um yeah that yeah. was that's mike corley that did the cover right Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great, great cover. Um, and for those that are kind of curious about maybe a glitch Mitchell, glitch Mitchell, uh, short story to read, you were on uh, my blog last August, um, when we did the 10 questions with as a written interview and you did a giveaway. And part of the giveaway is you would take some crazy suggestion from one of the readers and turn it into a short story. And I don't know if yeah, you remember yeah. this yes, <laughs> for those, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> for those that haven't read glitz Mitchell and his counterparts get stuck in Donald Trump's hair. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which I, I don't know whether that's, I guess being uh British Canadian, I, I probably get away with that now, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if an American author is allowed to write that kind of thing now, but get me, uh, get me blacklisted by the, the government now. Um, but yeah, that was, that was fun. Uh, there was lots of, lots of interesting suggestions, but when I saw that one, it was kind of, oh, that's, that's going to be interesting. And then, then it came up um, and it, it, it fits the, it actually fits the tone of the stories perfectly. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, it's definitely a lighthearted thing. Um, there's lots of in the novel and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, it was a perfect, perfect topic for it. And for those that might want to go read it, just head over to legendarium.com and you can search for just either glitch Mitchell, or I think it's called glitch Mitchell and the deadly follicle. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. So you can head over there and read it. It's still up. So, uh, head on over there and read that one. Um, so kind of speaking of, uh, giveaways kind of in a sort of in a way um i want to ask you about something you did for your newsletter subscribers this year in 2016 if they were on your newsletter list you sent uh, a short story every month for the year of 2016 do you yes. do you plan on doing something like that for your uh, newsletter subscribers in 2017 um, I'm not sure. I haven't. I'm. I kind of flip between yes and no. Um, the I, I certainly could. I've got plenty of short stories, and and the feedback has uh, been good. I I at the bottom of the stories, certainly the most recent ones. I actually have a star rating, and you can click um, and tell me whether or not you like the story, and and people seem to like them. Um, having said that, from a uh, from a mailing list perspective, it's it's perhaps not the best thing to do because it makes the emails very long um, and that kind of thing. So uh, it's difficult to say. I, I'm also looking at um, 
a, a lot of people have suggested that I take the stories and put them into a book. Um, so I might do that instead. Um, I might take some of those stories that I sent out this year and then a bunch of new ones and, and create an anthology and maybe do that. Um, I might set it up as a separate mailing list and so that it, it doesn't get tied in with the newsletter. I'm not, I'm not, sh- not entirely sure yet. So, um, but it's it's gone gone down very well. Um, I'm planning something big for the the final one, so um, the December one. Um, I'm hoping to pull together some interesting stuff for that. So um, people should subscribe, even if they only subscribe for the December one, and they'll get a bunch of cool stuff. And and when you subscribe, you actually get all the previous stories. You can click and read them all. So um, so yeah, it was it's an interesting experiment, and it's definitely definitely helped keep the the mailing list interesting and it i don't i only send a mailing out once a month um and i i i try i'm trying to make them interesting not just you know hey here's here's my book go buy it um and and the short stories i think are a good way of doing it and i've got lots and um you know i try to pick the ones that i think are good i've got some really bad ones as well but um i uh i try to think pick ones that are pretty good and, and um, uh, that have been published before or, or I just think are, are strong. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll see. It, it was good. I'm not sure yet. Sounds good. Uh, well, here at The Legendarium, we like to end each podcast episode on a segment that we call The Legendary Ending. Um, and these are just kind of some random questions. And I'm actually going to ask you a question I have never asked an author because I can't. You're the only person I can ask this. Right. You have a, <laughs> you have an author photo that we've used with you leaning against the Batmobile. <laughs> can yeah. you tell us yeah. the story behind that photo and how you got to be that close to the Batmobile? Yes. I, I try not to talk about it too much because um, cause I am Batman. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> No, no, no. Okay. Not really. No. Um, (laughs) yeah, actually that, that was very lucky. There's, um, so there's a guy called Andy Smith, who is a, a, a super experienced, super senior, um, special effects guy. And, and he was the guy who worked on the, the vehicles for the Christopher Nolan Batman films. Um, and he, he's, I mean, he's done tons of stuff. I, um, you can, if you just search for Andy Smith FX, I think that's his website. And he's, you know, he's done, I think, Mission Impossible and Frankenstein and just tons and tons of, of massive films. Um, but a few years back, he was, he was diagnosed with cancer and, and had to go through cancer treatment and he, he recovered. But as a thank you, um, he went on tour. I think this was around, um, the time the last Christopher Nolan Batman came out. Um, and he went on a tour with the Batmobile. Um, and he came up, came up to Vancouver with it and stopped off at the company I work at. Um, and he parked it outside the studio, um, for a couple of days, I think. Um, and we all got to go and hang out with the Batmobile. And then he, he gave a, a, a absolute fan, fantastic, fascinating talk about his career and just working on Batman. And he just took questions and, and told some fantastic stories. Um, I think some of which, which he, probably wasn't supposed to talk about, um, about filming and, and the vehicle and the kind of fun they had and showed clips from the, uh, from the show and uh, from the, from the film and just, just how difficult it was to do these things and you do these jumps with the Batmobile, but the Batmobile is actually really, really heavy. So it was, it was way too heavy to do the jumps that it does in the film and, and just the disasters and, and problems they had because of that. So, um, so yeah, so basically we got to, uh, we got to sit in front of the, the Batmobile and, uh, a friend of mine did, took, took some photos and then, you know, this was about four or five years ago, I guess. But, um, when I was looking for an author photo, I thought, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. That makes, <laughs> that makes me a lot, look a lot cooler than I am. So I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> that works. Did you get to sit in it or just stand next to it? No, just next to it. It, okay. it does, that one, um, does actually drive it. It is a, uh, car apparently he backed it in and it sounded like a jet part you know jet jet airplane oh wow but uh but no we we weren't allowed in it okay. but uh we got to sit on the tires and stroke it and just geek out over the batmobile that is awesome um what songs are currently on your writing playlist um so i can't listen to 
songs with singing. Um, I, I have to listen to instrumentals. Um, so I, I go for, for movie soundtracks. Um, I'm not, I'm not organized enough to deliberately pick songs that go with the type of writing I'm doing. Um, but at the moment I've got a whole host of things and just plays randomly. So I've got, um, things like Mad Max, the Fury Road, which is a fantastic soundtrack. Um, Ex Machina, which is, which is really good. Penny Dreadful, for, it's kind of horror stuff. Um, I've just added the Westworld e- EP that came out, mm-hmm. um, that's got some fantastic stuff on. Um, I've got the soundtrack of the last Terminator film, which is not a great film, but the, the soundtrack. <laughs> Soundtrack is excellent. Um, and I was actually working on a scene in the, in the girl in the machine that, I, that I've just finished where there was kind of like a cyborg wolf. And while I was writing that scene, the music from Terminator came on, which, which was just perfect, perfect timing. So, so I basically pick movies that I like that have got, um, interesting, interesting soundtrack. Okay. And I put my headphones on. It drowns out the rest of the world and, and lets me focus. Sounds good. Uh, if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, which one of your book characters uh, would you want to be stuck with and why? Um, that's a good question. Um, probably not Glitch because he's <laughs> just just a, he's just a nerd like me, really. Um, there's a there's a character in the the second Leah book um called rachel de silva she's she's a side character really but she she really likes guns so um i think she'd be a perfect person to have in the zombie apocalypse because she'd be able to shoot people um and and she's good with guns so i'd go and she flies a helicopter as well in the third book and and drops people onto a train so um she's she's clearly awesome and if you could pick any character from any media source Comics, books, movies, video games, television, whatever, uh, to be stuck in a zombie apocalypse with, who would you want to be stuck with and why? I think it'd have to be Batman, wouldn't it? It could. I've, you know, I've, I've been stealing I've been stealing credit for Batman for the last couple of years, so I should probably probably use Batman. He's cool. I I'm not um most of the superheroes I'm not a big fan. Iron Man is cool, but um mm-hmm. uh but Batman I think I think Batman would be good. Okay. Uh, if you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's lo- lots of things. I mean, it'd be tempting just to go forward four years just to see what, and uh, you know, go and visit America and see what happens um, mm-hmm. in after the next four years. Right. Um, but but that might not be a good idea. Um, I think I think though I would probably go back in time. And I would find the person who invented cheese and I would, I would stop them inventing cheese because, because cheese is vile. I mean, (laughs) you know, any, any food that you, you know, that you, you put mold in it and it makes it taste better. (laughs) If that's not a real food, um, and you know, it, 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 I, I don't know if you know this. So I know, I know a reasonable amount about cheese discovery because I was looking it up. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it's, you know, from they reckon it's maybe five thousand years BC or something, um, and they think it was discovered by milk being stored inside an animal's stomach um, that then went off, and they discovered cheese. And you know, some guy has just got this this animal stomach full of milk, and it's gone off, and he's like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, I haven't got anything else. I'll just eat that." Because <laughs> a woman, a woman's just going to throw that away because it's moldy <laughs> milk. But no, a guy is, "Oh, yeah, no, I'll try this. Yeah, this is tastes vile, but you know, it's it's okay." <laughs> So I'd go and find out who that guy was and just discourage him and, and perhaps hopefully stop cheese <laughs> becoming a thing. <laughs> oh, it's everywhere. Yeah. That's a funny answer. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Um, superpower. I, th- I think probably teleportation. Um, cause although I do run marathons, there's, there's times w- quite often where I just want to go home from something, um, you know, I go and see a film or something and I, I really just want to go home. So being able to teleport home, even if it was only teleport home, if that was the only superpower, <laughs> that would probably be, that would probably be fine. But being able to teleport anyway, anywhere safely would be pretty cool. And of course, the uh, question that we're kind of famous for here, a penguin walks through the door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say and why is he here? (laughs) 
Yeah, the, the penguin question. So <laughs> I, I was I was thinking about this because um, you know the, um, it would be rare for you not to ask this question. Um, clearly, this penguin keeps turning up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at the door, he's obviously looking for something, um, and he keeps turning up at the same door all the time. So he's he's obviously a time traveler. So you know, I'm I'm thinking, you know, with with the sombrero, penguins don't generally wear sombreros. Don't generally live in Mexico. So there must be you. Know, he's from the future. Climate change has has happened, mm-hmm. um, and there's been a lot of flooding. But it turns out Mexico was protected by a wall. Um, so it was saved from all the flooding. Um, and, you know, Mexico is now the, pretty much the, the superpower on the world. Um, but sadly, this, this polar bear has, um, has, has come to power. Um, on it. He's, he's campaigning to make Ar- the Arctic great again. Um, and he's, he's created this regime. Um, and the penguin has come back in time because one of my descendants, um, is leading the resistance against the polar bear. Um, and, and this penguin has come back in time to save me. So clearly he's going to say, come with me if you want to live. <laughs> there we go. You never disappoint with your answers. They're so great. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm just sad and I think about these things way too much. <laughs> Oh, that is a great answer there. Before we leave, do you have any advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with our listeners? Yeah, so I, I have something that that is a question that basically what you, you need to do, and I, I mean you in general listeners need to do, is is answer this question immediately. Um, you know, you don't have to do this right now, but um, whatever the, you want to get the first thing that comes into your into your head after, when I ask this question. So the question is: You're walking walking across the street, all the lights are out. Um, it's in Banco, Vancouver, so it's rainy, um, it's dark. Um, and the Batmobile comes flying down the street, no lights, super quick, 200 miles an hour. It's going to hit you. You're going to die. What do you wish you'd done? And the answer to that question is the thing that you should probably be doing with your life. And uh, that that was asked online of me sometime a uh, long, long time ago, probably 20, 20 plus years ago, more than that even. Um, and And the answer that I gave was writing. Um, and that kind of always sticks in the back of my mind um, and is one of the reasons why I now write every day. And I, I have that kind of momentum to try and write stories and, and publish them. Very good advice. Um, where can our listeners go if they would like to learn more about you or your stories? Um, the easiest way is probably on my website, which is www.solitarymindset.com. Um, you can also – Facebook is facebook.com slash solitarymindset. Um, Twitter is at solitarymindset. Um, but the website is probably the easiest place to go. Is there a story behind Solitary Mindset? Um, it's actually a lyric from a song, um, a guy called Matt Costa, um, who's a singer songwriter. Um, I actually can't remember the name of the song, um, but it really stuck in, in my mind. And I actually bought the, bought the domain because I just liked this idea of solitary mindset, um, because it kind of suits me. I'm, I'm quite an introvert. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just stuck with me and I didn't really have a use for it, but I bought the domain name. Um, and then when I started writing, you know, Philip Harris is actually a, a very well-known scientific equipment company in the UK. And I think they have any Philip Harris domain name. Um, so there was no way to get that. Um, so solitary mindset seemed like a good, a good fit. And I could get Twitter and Facebook and, and I think it's probably Instagram and all the other ones as well, but um, uh, Pinterest. Um, but yeah, I, I just liked the concept and it stuck with me. Oh, okay. I knew there had to be a story. <laughs> yeah, there's always a story. It's always just a not story. necessarily just not necessarily very interesting. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and coming on 30 Minute Author Interviews. We appreciate it. Thanks very much. It was great fun. Thanks for having me on. Well, guys, that's all the time we've got for this episode. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and listening to 30-Minute Author Interviews. We hope you come back next Wednesday and every Wednesday for a brand new episode. 
Head on over to Legendarium.com and check out the show notes for this episode. Philip Harris has a giveaway that runs until Tuesday, December 27th. Everyone that enters wins a free ebook copy of The Girl in the City, plus one lucky winner will win all eight of his ebooks, including The Girl in the Machine, which releases early next year. Good luck, everyone, and until next time, stay legendary. Nailed it.